Hey, take your Bibles now and open up to Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine, I think I've been saying eight all day, but that's wrong. We'll go ahead and fast forward to Mark chapter nine. And let me read to you a lengthy section of scripture. I'll set the tone in a very simple way though. Jesus has taken his 12 disciples, his best friends on a walk to Northern Israel where the war is escalating right now near Tyre and Sidon and Damascus and Syria and Lebanon, way up there. And it's all messed up now, it was all messed up then. And when Jesus took him up there to Caesarea Philippi, the headwaters of the Jordan River, he took him up there and it was Crazyville. It was a place where a good Jew wouldn't go very often, if at all. So Jesus took his boys to that area and with that backdrop in motion and in sight, Jesus says, who do you think I really am? Now, this could have been a trick question. Jesus, his disciples had already surrendered everything to be his followers. They'd already given up everything, house and home and family, to follow Jesus. And now he's asking them once again, essentially, are you guys in it to win it? Do you guys really know what you're getting into? Look at me, he would say. Do you know who I am? And the reason he was asking them to look at me, do you know who I am? Because he knew that the waters ahead weren't gonna get any easier Sometimes we think if we give our lives to Jesus, say the right prayer, do the right things, become the right person, it's gonna be so much easier. Have you guys heard this before? It's not true. Man, it's the opposite. Ooh, if anybody desires to come after me and be godly, you're gonna be persecuted. There's gonna be suffering and difficulty and hardship. What? Why? Because in that persecution, difficulty, suffering, and hardship, that's where faith, hope, and love grow best. That's where character and maturity and the things that God wants to produce in us in our short little lives happen the best. You need to know this, you need to understand this because then if and when darkness and difficulty and suffering and trials find your way, uh, if you don't know these things, you're gonna be confused. You're gonna be disappointed. You're gonna be over challenged. You're gonna be lured to something sillier and compromises every single time. So Jesus takes them up into this area, asks them, who do you say that I am? And Simon, Peter, and the boys confess, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the chosen one, the only one, the predicted one, the prophesied one, the promised one, Deuteronomy 18 fulfilled. <gasps> and Jesus was so pleased. He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Pete. Nobody told this to you. Listen, my Father in heaven showed this to you. This is where you are saved, born again, made new, transformed. The Greek word there for transformed is metamorpho, or where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's from the inside out. And I hope and believe, I don't know, but I hope and believe that every single one of you here this morning have been metamorphosed, metamorphosized, changed from the inside out. Not just the outside in, you realize that it's the outside in changes that we call religion, where we change the outside, we do a few things, and we act differently than some other people. It's all outward, not the inside. And yet what Jesus wants to establish, oh, and he's such a good God. He knows when we haven't done that yet. He knows when that's out of order. And so he'll take us on walks and on journeys and asks us searching questions. Who do men say that I am? Well, immediately after they professed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus then began to explain to them, hey, in my future, Jesus is, there's gonna be suffering, there's gonna be rejection, and there's going to be crucifixion, and there's gonna be resurrection, those four things. They then argued against these things, and Peter pushed back, and Jesus had to rebuke him and take him on a little teachable moment walk. And then Jesus began to say, look, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And I wonder if Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples, all of their eyes were as big as saucers. Did he just say, take up our cross and follow him? We're in Roman country. They just showed us what crucifixion, I don't know. Did he know what he's saying? Someone needs to stop this guy. And so Jesus then says this, and I guarantee you, they were just shaking their heads going, this is crazy. We just confessed who he is, but now he's telling us all these things. It doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, fast forward to about a year from now, after Jesus died, was buried and rose from the dead, still on the forefront of their minds, they would ask Jesus in his resurrected body, oh, are you now going to restore Israel to its glory? We're all about that restoration and moving forward. We, and Jesus says, no, the father's gonna do that when it's time. Until then, you occupy. Until then, get my Holy Spirit. He's coming soon. 
And you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the way to South Beach, Oregon. That's what it says there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And now in chapter 9. Jesus, being the master shepherd, the master teacher, the master friend, knows his disciples are perplexed. They're perturbed. They don't know what's happening. And look at verse 1. Jesus said to them, we studied this last week, assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. That would be good news on the heels of the bad news they just heard. Jesus says, hey, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me, look at look at look at Some of you aren't gonna die until you see the power of God coming in glory. Oh, okay, we need that. We'll let what happens next. It says, now after six days, that's a long time, by the way, when Jesus just promised you something. After six days, like, what happened the next day? Doesn't say. By the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this portion of scripture. John does not. John was there. Peter was there, and James was there. Matthew wasn't there. Luke wasn't there. Mark wasn't there. But they all knew this was such a big deal, they recorded this mountain of transfiguration that happened there in Israel, Mount Hermon, He took now Peter, James, and John, and he led them up on a high mountain six days later, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured, the word there, metamorphosized. Before them, verse three, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. And then Elijah appeared to them, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Jesus answered, and, or then Peter, verse five, answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, man, it's good for us to be here. Oh, Pete. And let us make three tabernacles. Those would be dwelling places, places like tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came over and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. And now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen, listen, until the son of man had risen from the dead. And so they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, hey, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, indeed, Elijah is coming first, and he restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Stop right there, eyes up here. Can you imagine coming down the mountainside with Jesus after experiencing all this and you're about to talk to your buddies about it and Jesus says, hey, let's not talk about this whole thing for a while. You're like, what? Are you for real? You just transfigured in front of our eyes. We saw your glory as it is. As a matter of fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe what happened to Jesus, this transfiguration. And all of them describe it differently based on what they experienced from the firsthand reports from Peter, James, and John. And if you've ever seen an author or a painter try and make this happen, it looks like the light is shining on Jesus. A light came and glowed about him. What really happened is, is the light finally emanated from Jesus in his glorious being. You could call it the miracle of transfiguration where he was transformed into glory or a different miracle took place. That is the miracle of governing his glory ceased for a minute. Do you know when Jesus was on planet earth, he was 100% God and 100% man? He was that glorious being. But lest you and I find ourselves attracted to him unknowingly or unwillingly because his glory was so big, he cloaked himself in humanity, except for this moment when a little bit of his virtue shined through. Whiter than any launderer on earth could whiten, whiter than snow, whiter than the sun itself. See, this is the transformation hope that you and I have, by the way, that when you and I become believers, that we're transformed from the inside out, that we can be made new. How white, whiter than anything on earth could do, that we could be changed, that we could be made new. This has to be good news for you. You can go to AA, which if you need to, you should. You can go to NA, if you need to, you should. You can go to other step groups and recovery groups and learn some steps and some behavior modification. All of those are good and will lead you forward out of the ditch that you're in. 
but they cannot actually transform you from the inside out. Only God can do this. This is what the Bible says that the Lord does for you and does for me. And Jesus showed this to the boys, and I believe he shows it to us as well, who need to be transformed, who need to be prepared for the future that lies in front of us. See, Jesus had just told the disciples here, it's gonna get difficult. There's gonna be tribulation. There's gonna be a taking up of your cross. There's gonna be sacrifice. But hey, check it out. I need you to focus your attention on me. I need you to make sure, listen, you put your eyes upon my glory daily because otherwise you're gonna find yourself tripping and stumbling and becoming discouraged in your own souls. As a matter of fact, I believe Jesus took Peter, James, and John, these three, because while they didn't write Matthew, Mark, or Luke, these three would go on to write the Bible. Peter, James, and John. James would write the book of, or James would write the book of James. John would write the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. And Peter would write the book of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And these guys were used so powerfully, but the only reason they were used so powerfully is because they saw Jesus perfectly. Now, let me just try and make sure I can extract this. I believe this is the purpose of this entire text, is that God wants to save us. That's why he desperately asks, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He'll go to great lengths and ask you again and again and again. He might feel like he's even asking you until you finally get it right. Don't you love it when a teacher or a test gives you opportunity to keep answering until you get it right? I love those tests. They're the best. And Jesus, I'm gonna ask you again until you get this right. You need to know that you know that you know that I am the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Because when you truly know who Jesus is, only then will you know who you are. And let's say you're like me and you do know who Jesus is and you do know who you are, but every single day is a battle. Every single day is a challenge. Every single day there's an attack. The Lord says, let's go up to the mountain, Luke. Let's spend some time together. You see things better at a higher vista. You see things better when the crowds are dissipated, when it's just you and me. Maybe a couple friends as we see in the story, but it's just you and Jesus. And if you're like me and you are in battles and there are attacks and there are tests daily and it's not getting any easier, it's these times set apart. Listen, not so you can show up to Jesus and show him your glory, your virtue. Isn't that a temptation? Man, the Lord, he, he just wants me to get stronger. He wants me to figure things out. He wants me to be, know more and do more and say more. Oh, Lord, I, I'm, I'm failing and falling short. And yet I don't think that's the right motivator. I think if you're like me, like these boys here, and God has a plan for your life and he's using you, the most important thing for you is that you would find yourself in the presence of his glory and that he would flex and that he would become more. And the more you see him, listen, what happens to you, the more you know him, the more you understand, the more you avail yourself to him. A veil. It's like the veil. As a matter of fact, let me read to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter three. Paul says this to the church at Corinth, chapter three, verses 15 through 18. He says, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Verse 18 but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the Lord. Stop right there, eyes up here. What is Paul saying to the church at Corinth? He's saying, guys, gals, the veil's been removed. The veil of Moses, where they didn't understand all things. We now with unveiled face, we can see, see what? The glory of God. And when we look at the glory of God and behold him, the Bible promises you, and it tells to me that we're being changed from glory to glory. How? By exposing ourselves to the Lord, by spending more time with him. I think this is so important, especially in today's day and age, where the challenges are real, the risks are high, the needs are many. What are we gonna do? I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We need to spend more time at the feet of Jesus Christ. You must spend time gazing upon his glory. You don't have enough in and of yourself. 
you can't become more. You can't do it. It's not about you. It's not about Peter, James, or John, or Elijah, or Moses. Peter here, in this moment, interrupts what's going on. There's a talk going on. Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus, and Peter yells out, hey! Can you imagine Jesus talking to Elijah and Moses? Sorry, guys. Yeah, Pete, not, not right now, Pete. Come on, man, this is crazy. Can you see what's going on? Hey! Pete. And Jesus says, Elijah, Moses, I'll catch up with you guys. I'm so sorry. I gotta talk to Pete. And Pete says, it's so good that we're here. Is it, Pete? Is it, Pete? And Pete suggests that we make three tabernacles, not three altars. Three altars would have been offensive too. An altar is a place of worship. Let's worship. Let's worship you and you and you. That's bet you can't worship Elijah and Moses. But he didn't even say let's worship Jesus. He said, let's build a tabernacle. Let's build a tabernacle. That's a tent. In other words, what Peter's saying, this is so sick. I'm not going down the mountain. I love it here. Let's hang out for a while. I like this environment. I like it here. And the Holy Spirit, the Father in heaven comes and interrupts Pete. Aren't you glad when God interrupts you from being a dumb dumb? I'm not messing with you. Like that should be your prayer daily. It's like, Lord, high control me, okay? I always pray this prayer with people. I said, Lord, keep me on a short leash. Like, don't let me get out of there. You see those dogs on a long leash? Not this guy. Keep me right here, Lord. And Peter starts saying dumb stuff and the father shows up and says, hey, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then what's he say? Hear him. Now I got a lot of stuff to say about this. Elijah represents the prophets. He had the prophetical word, the power, the miracles. There are some believers today that love the powerful and the prophetic and the miracles. I love the powerful, prophetical, and miracles as well. I'm glad that's part of the kingdom of God. They're flowing right now. The spirit's not ceased. The spirit is flowing. Those things happen. People get healed all the time. Miracles happen all the time. There are some people, though, that want to build a tabernacle around Elijah, if you wouldn't say, let's go ahead and bring this into fruition. There's also some people who want to build their tabernacles around Moses. Moses represents not the prophets or the powerful, but the law, religion, and all the to-dos and the to-don'ts and regulations. Don't raise your hands, but have you ever been around a Christian or a believer that's really religious and loves all their systems? And sometimes we want to worship God through our systems, and sometimes we want to worship God through our power and our prophets and all these other things. And yet in this context here and in this story, the father comes and says, hey, don't do that. Hear him which I would say is so simple. How do we hear God's voice? A couple different ways. Through his Holy Spirit. We hear through creation. Psalm 19 tells us that. We hear through one another, through the body of Christ. But the primary way that you and I are to walk through this life is through God's word already been given to us. To know his voice, to hear his voice, to walk in his word. His word is a lamp for our feet. It's a light for our path. How are you gonna know the glory of God? How are you gonna continue to bask like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter three with an unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of God? I believe firmly that this story was preparation for the lives that Peter and James and John were going to live. They needed to know that they know that they know who Jesus Christ was in order that they could be used. As a matter of fact, Peter, when he wrote his second epistle, he says it in an interesting way. This is his own words. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or just look at the screen. It's a long section. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Peter's a pastor here, reminding the congregation what they already knew. He says, yet I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Stop right there, eyes up here, just a sub-thought. Peter's saying, I'm just gonna tell you guys what you already know while I'm here, before I die. He didn't say before I die, he said before I put off this tent, just as the Lord told me. Did you know when Elijah and Moses were on the mountain of transfiguration years before Peter said this, that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus, Luke only, Matthew not, Mark not, Luke only tells us that they were talking about a certain subject. What subject was that? Jesus putting off his tent, dying. What was the conversation of topic? The law? Moses standing there asking Jesus, hey, is everyone following the law? How's the religion going? Everything going great over there? I did a real good job, didn't I? No, that's not what they're talking about. Or Elijah talking about the powerful and the prophetical. Hey, all the prophets, is all this happening? No. Elijah and Moses both pointed to Jesus Christ, asking him and preparing him, if you would, 
for Jesus' upcoming death. The same thing Jesus talked to them at Caesarea Philippi about, that he would be suffered, that he would be rejected, and he would be crucified and die. The word there that Luke uses as Jesus talked about his death is the word that we get, our English word, exodus. It's a real cool word to talk about death. Because we don't like talking about death, do we? It's scary. I did a memorial yesterday for Jackie Dino. And we all who celebrated her life, we knew that she wasn't with us. She had made an exodus from this life and she had been delivered and was now with the Lord in glory. And we who are believers have this same hope. Peter here on the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus tells him, you're gonna die too. Look at verse 14. Knowing surely I must put off my tent just as our Lord showed me. Look at verse 15. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Verse 16, he quotes now the mountain of transfiguration. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from, from, from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And also, so we have the prophetic, well, listen, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, for a holy man of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Stop right there, eyes up here. Peter in his last book writes to the leaders of the church, to the pilgrims that had been dispersed, the ones suffering. He says, we didn't come up with cunningly devised fables. <laughs> but instead we told you the glory of God that we witnessed. On the holy mountain, God overshadowed us and told us what to focus on. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And then Peter reiterates it and says, you know what we have? The more prophetic word of God. That's what you're to be about. That's what we're to be about. That's how we're to be about in our lives. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And you and I right now, we're in a journey. We're in a race. We're in a battle. And I promise you, the way you're going to stay strong and successful and joy-filled is not based on your own energies or efforts, period. The way you're going to stand immovable and unshakable is when you position yourself in the glory of God and remind yourself daily who he is. This has to be the way. Why did this happen? What's going on to the mountain of transfiguration? Jesus says, it's gonna be rough sledding. Let's go for a walk. I need you guys to see something. Because there's gonna be a confirmation coming that is, as it says in Romans, a pull of the world to conform you to its ways. There's gonna be pressure. There's gonna be pulls. There's gonna be distractions. Every single day. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 12? He tells you and me to beseech ourselves by the mercies of God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word transformed in Romans chapter 12, verse two, is metamorpho, from the inside out, to be changed once again, and again, and again, and again, how are you gonna be changed? How am I gonna be secure? How am I gonna not blow it in this life? By spending time in God's word, observing God's glory. This is why we take communion every single Sunday. We can't forget what he's done. I'm gonna take communion at the 10 a.m. service. I'm the most blessed one. I'm gonna take communion at the 12 p.m. service. It's so rad. My communion cups get stacked up over there six or seven high sometimes. And I, I love it. Reminds me of his glory, reminds me of what he's done. And I believe lest you and I find ourselves becoming discouraged. What, what does it say to the writer of the Hebrews? It says to us in Hebrews chapter 12, to run our race well, to get rid of the sins and the weights that so easily ensnare us, putting our attention on Jesus, lest we become weary and discouraged in our own souls. 
the story of the transformation, the transfiguration. Jesus does all this for them that they would find themselves. Look at verse seven. And a cloud came and overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Don't worry about the prophecies. Don't worry about the power. Don't worry about the miracles. Don't worry about Moses and what he has to say. Look at Jesus. All of them are pointing to Jesus Christ. And suddenly, verse eight, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. As you and I get older, as we continue on in our journey, this is what's going to happen. There'll be nothing else around us. No one else save Jesus Christ. This is the goal because all other things, even Moses, even Elijah, how cool is that? How cool is that? Not as cool as Jesus. Not as cool as Jesus. And when we find ourselves and everything else slipping away, look at verse nine, a few things, and we'll follow with some worship today. It says, now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Stop right there, eyes up here. With this new revelation came now new obligation. This would have been hard, wouldn't it? Hey guys, let's not talk about this for a while. <laughs> okay. Somehow they did it. As a matter of fact, Peter James and John weren't the ones to write the gospels, but these other guys did, and the story was recount, recounted later after the fact. And I believe what the Lord wants for you and for me as he leads us into revelation and truth, he wants us then to walk obedient and to be those men and women who say, I'll do what Jesus wants me to do. And I don't know who's gonna hear this right now. Maybe you're a believer, you're a Christian here. You're going to heaven by faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, amen. But maybe the Lord's having you do some hard stuff right now. And you're like me, you're an American, you've got your freedoms. You've got your things that maybe it doesn't make sense for you to sacrifice in this way or to, to serve in this way or to obey in this way. I would have argued at this point, what do you mean we can't tell the guys? That was crazy. And if you know your Bible, you know they come down the mountain <gasps> immediately into a firestorm. The other nine disciples are down below struggling. There's a suicidal boy. And they're trying to lead him to the Lord and they're unable to do so. Can you imagine Peter, James, and John? They just saw the power. This would be a, a struggle. So too, in your life, there's struggles. I would encourage you, whatever the Lord has revealed to you and asking you to do right now, don't argue him. Do what he says. These guys came down the mountain and they did what Jesus said to do. They kept the word to themselves, questioning about Elijah and what was happening. And then Jesus spoke to those things and he gave them instruction. Guys, I'm gonna have the worship team come up and here's how we're going to end our service today. Right now, what you need in your life, everybody has a need right now, everybody has a need. Past problems, present problems, future problems. And those problems are solved. Those problems are met. Those problems are ministered to in the glory of God as you see him as he is. As you do this in the morning when you read the Bible, as you do this in the morning when you worship, when you pray, when you go about your day, when we do what we do on Sundays, as Jesus Christ is lifted up, John the Baptist said it most, he said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men, my Father will draw all men unto himself, and that's what I need, that's what you need, is to be closer to God, closer to his glory, closer to his strength, and all of that comes in the simplest way by putting our eyes and attention on Jesus. If you're struggling right now, any struggle at all, maybe it's doubt, maybe it's fear, Maybe there's a temptation you keep falling to. Maybe there's anxiety that plagues you. Loneliness, bitterness, unforgiveness, all kinds of things, so many, so many things in the world. Jesus would take you and say, let's go up to the mountain. Let's spend some time. Oh Lord, do you want me to do some push-ups on the mountain? You want me to recite scripture? You want me to do what I can do? He said, no, I need you to see my glory. I need you to remind yourself who I am. Because if you forget, you're gonna become weary and discouraged. You're gonna do silly things. You're gonna come up short. You're gonna get off track. You're gonna drift away. But if like a lighthouse shining in the distance, you see me, you'll know your course. You'll know where you're going. You'll know what to do. Jesus, preparing the boys for what's to come. Would you guys stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name now, Lord, it's so simple, but so profound. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would become more glorious in our eyes than ever before. That, Lord, we would see you high and lifted up. And that even today, Lord, we would confess and repent and let you have your way. Lord, I'll be the first to do that. Would you forgive me, Lord, for being distracted? 
distracted from your glory and maybe even attracted to other lesser things, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that you would show yourself to us once again in your word, in your spirit, through your body, in creation, Lord, in any way you see. And if you're here this morning, you would say, Lord, I just need to see your glory. I need to know that I know that I know who you are daily, not just once at confession, not just once at this time, but every single day. And if you would say, Lord, I need help in doing so, but I want that. Would you raise up your hand right now? No one's looking. Just raise up your hand and say, yeah, I want that. I want to see the Lord everywhere I go. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to have it wrong. I don't want to be like Peter trying to build a tabernacle where I shouldn't. <laughs> if you don't want to be wrong, just raise up your hand and say, I don't want to do it wrong. High control me, Lord. High control me. My hand is up, Lord. Have your way in my heart. Have your way in my heart. I'm going to have some prayer people come up. Maybe Pastor Rory or if Katrina's up here on the right for some gals. If you need prayer during this time, you can come forward and get prayed for. You can come to the altar, kneel down and say, Lord, forgive me for not being about your glory. We need you, Lord. Descend upon this place even as we sing this song. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's pray and respond together. If you need prayer, come forward.